They have some great little animals here too. So. <laughs> well, I have a great affection for monkeys. <laughs> I like monkeys. Uh, my earliest collecting was in this category of cow creamers. And this is because I had a dairy farm in Vermont. And I'll show you later my first cow creamer. And it was a guest came up and she had stopped at a toll road and they have these gigaw shops on the toll road mm -hmm. and she bought this cow for me because she said I know you must like cows you have so many of them and I actually at the time I probably had around 120 or 123 and I don't have the records anymore uh, you, had, you had cows like like uh, like an earthenware or, or no I had actual cows producing milk oh okay it got a, it it was a dairy farm okay and that's why she brought this cow and then I realized that there were objects, uh, cow productions that were made in ceramic. So I started collecting them. Well, I think until about 1967, the most I ever paid for a cow creamer was around $12. But then I, one night I was on, in New York on business. I was coming back from dinner late. I walked down 57th Street and I stopped at an antique shop window. Lights were on and in that window was this cow creamer. Now this is just a cow creamer. It's the Wielden type. This is called manganese coloration. Mm -hmm. This one happens to have a calf with it. And I thought, wow, that would be neat to have. So the next day I went AWOL from my job for a couple of hours and went to this shop and went in to see a woman whose name was Millie Monheim. And we started talking about cow creamers. And I said, you know, I would really like to have that. And she said, it's yours. It's $2,500. <laughs> and I suddenly realized uh, cows could be more expensive than what I had been buying. This is the second one that I bought from her about a month later. This is just plain white. Uh, now it's a creamer, so how did, how did it work? Oh, you pour, put, you pour put the milk there, or cream, cream in the there. And they, came, they are not very sanitary. And this, again, is, is the kind of the obviousness of discretionary income. You don't need this. Right. This is, is purely decorative, but they were used at table. And then as I began to collect them, there, there are all kinds of them. I actually at one time had 147 of these, but I have sold off all but 40. Here's one that just has a milkmaid uh -huh. on it. And I don't want to get into it too much, but they're, some of them are very anatomically correct. Uh, this is one in agate ware. Some of these pots are in the, were in the collection of Princess Diana's mother, Mrs. Shand, S-H-Y-N-D, kid. Mm -hmm. All of those pots there. This is extremely unusual that almost all of these pots likely had an under tray like this because they had not quite developed the internal, for instance, the holes that keep the leaves from coming through the spout. And the spouts would usually drip and it would go on your tablecloth or your fine mahogany mm -hmm. side uh, table or something. So they were almost always. Uh, made with an under tray like this, but I've only be able, been able to find two of them, and this is one where I found the whole set. Yeah. More cows. Uh, now you can get into some of the printed. Well, let me get the look, cobwebs out of the way here. <laughs> no, this. Oh no, there. There's your spider. Just there's just spinning around up there. Where is he? Yeah, I see him. Well, why, why can't I get them on camera? I don't know, because I think it's just too small. No. There he is. <laughs> well, I hope for God you're not going to show the spider web. <laughs> David, come on. Uh, anyway, but you can see, now you can see that they're the beginnings of print, that those are printed on the, the pots. All right. Most of these were made in Staffordshire and probably in places like Stoke-on-Trent or Hanley, but they were shipped across country to Liverpool, where a company whose name was Sadler and Green 
were really experts at printing, so huge quantities of blanks were sent over to Liverpool to be printed and then got in the trade. And how did they print on them? They were round at the time, so how did they print on them? There, there was a, like a tissue that mm -hmm. had the ink on it that was pressed into okay. it, and then it was when it was fired, the paper would dissipate and the ink would stay on there. Oh, okay, all right. There. And there are other ways. This can also be done with gelatin. All That's right. a way of doing it. And later I'll show you something where they also apply gold to okay. the surface, as they did here. And, and uh, But it shows up better on black. But here, the powdered gold was put into oil okay. and painted on. The oil would dissipate mm -hmm. and the gold, which is very soft and very, it comes off very easily. The gold does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it does with porcelain. Porcelain also. too. It's, it's like what tends to rub off. But you can see on this side, it's almost all gone. Yeah, right. Oh. But it does show that these pieces were used. We know, for instance, this is Lofsey Mouth, which is up on the far north coast of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And it was made for their, the first person from that area that was elected to Parliament. Okay. We have a background on that. When I say we are talking, all of us, mm -hmm. alcohol, I mean, ceramaholics. Right, ceramaholics. <laughs> shoot a couple here. So, and this lion here is? It's a lioness, uh, okay. and it's just another animal figure, but in, in plain creamware. The little uh, strainers that you see on each side. These, yeah. Yeah, those were actually that tea strainers. And there, there are some with larger openings on them that were probably used to uh, get the yolk when you needed just the yolk. In which oh, you're interesting, cooking. okay. The melon that you're coming to there, uh, a really unusual find was the handle you see sticking out was the handle that went with that. They're very fragile. They usually get lost. Mm -hmm. If you want me to take it out, I can show mm -hmm. you that it's oh, sure. a particular. And th these things were used for probably for preserved fruits or uh, gravies of one sort or another. And okay, it, very cool. These were made to to go with it. All of this fretwork is cut out by hand or with little dies. I mm -hmm. mean, it with dies. in the middle shelf are what we know are uh, Josiah Wedgwood from a catalog that he produced in 1763, I believe it was, and these particular shapes and decoration were listed. In the two plates on the back, the one on the left is a part of a service that Josiah Wedgwood made for Catherine the Great of Russia, the second service that he made for her. The first one was called the Frog Service. Mm -hmm. This is called the Husk, H-U-S-K, service. On this side is a Russian reproduction of that, that as the pieces got broken in use, because this was in one of her lesser palaces, instead of sending back to England and Wedgwood and reordering, she had her own factory make them. And the detail, just at a glance, seems to be pretty good. But if you look carefully, that's a much better mm -hmm. uh, case of decoration. So this would be the original there. That's the original from the husk service. And on this side, there is a Russian mark and date when she had it reproduced at her own factory. Okay. 
And that would be a strainer That's of some probably sort? probably just a simple strainer that was used at table. Mm -hmm. okay. And mm -hmm. the, these little baskets and things like this were used for either sweets or sweetmeats or maybe pickles or some kind of condiment of some kind. Okay. Here are instances from this up of English pottery that was sent in a blank state mm -hmm. to uh, Holland to be decorated. Okay. And these are the, usually the most identifiable aspect of this is this particular iron red that it really wasn't used by any other decorators that we know of and that deep iron red probably signals that it is a Dutch decorated piece. So this, is a, this is an earlier one. This is probably from 1745, 1750 that was also produced in Holland. And we're not sure in every case whether it was a shortage of skilled artisans to do the decoration or whether they just did it because it was cheaper to be done there. Mm -hmm. We don't know for sure. But many times these pieces were also meant to stay in Holland because the, the, the language on them is, is Dutch, okay. so, but it is an English, um, a Yorkshire uh, canister, and the plates are probably Yorkshire or Staffordshire. Mm -hmm. And the cows were just other cows? Just other cows. Now, right. then, so this is an actually a correct anatomical, so the person is actually, that's, that's a pretty big cow. Yes, it is. Mm, got it. Well, they but, giant, did they have giant cows in... Uh, <laughs> yeah. well, there's some that are thinking that other. Yeah, but I'm, you turn off your calic cough <laughs> camera for a minute. This, David, is the earliest piece of uh, pottery in my collection. This is about 1690 to 1695, and it's from uh, Norwich, North. Uh, Northumberland, in that area. It's salt glaze stoneware, and it is double-bodied. Meaning? Let me take it out, because I can't show you otherwise. Well, I'll actually leave that open like that. I'll get a little bit more light. That's oh, much better. Aha! Uh -huh. Yes! Well, first of all, look, you can see that the, it is a separate body. Okay, got it. Okay, and then this is pierced through. Mm. So you can actually see the... And usually, uh, these very frequently got severely chipped around the top, mm -hmm. and it's very ordinary today to see them with a silver edge that's been put on them. Okay. Uh, but this is this is extremely unusual to find. What year was that? And you think this is around 1690. Okay. And they were made up to probably 1710, mm -hmm. but. We think that that one was earlier, primarily because of where it was found. Got it, okay. Uh, the, the pipes are questionable. We don't know whether they're English or Dutch. And they've been sold both ways. This is an assembled tea set of, uh, for either for children or salesman samples. These are just miniatures of one sort or another. Okay. to get it, I'm sure, um, that the English potters in the early parts of production as the industry was developing recognized that the early things coming in from China were very, very saleable. Mm -hmm. And particularly uh, objects that were meant to contain or be part of the tea service, okay. tea pots, tea bowls, tea saucers, and so forth. And being good merchants, as most Englishmen were at the time, still are, they said, what the heck, we have this same kind of clay here. We can make these pots ourselves. And they made up false Chinese marks on the bottom of their pots. Okay. And this is the only one that we can identify for sure because it has a W on it. Mm -hmm. We think that it may be either Willis or Wedgwood. But most of them are just 
Okay. Scribbles in pseudo Chinese characters. And that was made about when? Uh, this would be late uh, 18th century, 1780, 1790. Okay, got it. And the important thing here, and I think you can get this, if you can't, we should give you more light around here, mm -hmm. is done on what is called a lathe. That this was actually put on what is called a puntel, this way, mm -hmm. and turned, and that was put on by a machine. This is machine decoration. And you still can't see it, but it's, it's right there. <laughs> But anyway, okay. it sounds close good. to porcelain because it does it does have a ring. Mm -hmm. This is some more uh, enamel decorated stoneware. Nothing new that I can show you or tell you here, except that this is a known. Uh, Turf figure from a play that when uh, Mozart's opera Abduction from the Seraglio mm -hmm. was presented, that there were a number of these that were made at that same time, perhaps uh, as part of the uh, sales pitch for the opera when it reached London. Okay. This is interesting because of the name for it. What do you think this is? Um, Japanese shinans. It would be a, either a, um, uh, a, a flower vase or the other thing I would say is it looks pretty much... Like a bottle? Um, yeah, for like a genie out of a bottle. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's, this probably was part of a set of a basin and this, uh -huh. and it is just a bottle. But the English have a name for it, and if you remember when you were studying the English language and you had to know about parts of the English language, like mm -hmm. verbs and nouns and adjectives, this is, uh, this is called a guglet. A guglet. Guglet. And why? Because when you pour from it, it goes guggle, guggle, guggle. Okay. And they, they, that's the proper name. It is a guglet. Onomatopoeia. If you remember that from your English. Now, Dad has a piece of porcelain that looks very similar to that. Yes. And Ganetta, Ganetta looks at this and she said, I am humbled. This is better decorated than some of the Dupacier that I have seen. Uh -huh. And your dad some, has some very fine Dupacier pieces. Right. And this, this is spectacular. And this was made when? This would be about 1770. Okay. All, right. All stoneware. All stoneware. Enamel decorated stoneware. And finally, we'll get you to the last one. I think you've been in here. Maybe. 